Hey, uh, hello again. Uh, thought I would take this time to do a little video update on where we're at with the um, the uh, mechanical hand or the prosthetic hand project. That's pretty much uh, the only thing on my plate. Got some interesting things coming in. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, get right through. I, I mentioned in a blog update that uh, I got my shipment of 223 brass. See if I can find the camera here. This is pretty neat. Um, this was the uh, cartridge Kyle said he uh, used the most of. This is the 5.56 millimeter uh, NATO round. I got about 100 of these. It comes out to be about 2 pounds. Um, so that's pretty neat. That is going to be melted down, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute, uh, to make the structure of the, uh, of the hand, what would be, I guess, the bones of the hand. Uh, additionally, uh, because I wanted some of the some of the structural elements, but also to get a little bit of variety, and because I think they're just completely badass, I picked up uh, 25 rounds of empty uh, 50 uh, BMG. It's the 50 Browning machine gun cartridge. This is, I mean, give you some example of the. It's really impressive. It's pretty cool to look at it. Um, yeah, this is. The two different size cartridges that we're dealing with, you know, and and you know, for all intents and purposes, the bullet diameter is twice the diameter, about a quarter inch diameter bullet for the 22, um, and uh, about uh, half inch diameter for the 50 cal. Um, but of course, the weight, uh, the mass of the projectile, is is uh, it's a it's an exponential rise, you know. It's, volumetric um, but uh, it's really impressive and one of the reasons I really focused on uh, the 50 BMG is I was thinking uh, about the the joints and they're going to be essentially circular discs that meet together where each of the bones would meet and that's going to give me a lot of options as far as uh, how to install controls or you know even some actuation to to allow it to move uh, not a priority but you know I'm thinking thinking ahead and I started thinking about the diameter of the 50 caliber cartridge at the base of the cartridge and it's it was pretty well exactly what I wanted for the two or three uh, largest knuckles uh, joints uh, on the hand that I'm working on and that would be the the base where the wrist meets the um, arm, uh, the first knuckle, and then the second knuckle for all of them except maybe the pinky. So what I started doing is taking a pipe wrench and cutting the ends off. And you've got just this massive lug of brass at the end of each of these cartridges. It's um, from the from the bottom of the cavity to the very butt of the shell it's about uh, four tenths of an inch I don't know if that's exactly right but it's it's really thick and these are going to go together to create uh, the knuckle joints which I think is is pretty slick they won't look like cartridges I wasn't gonna go all campy and have like bullet art <laughs> um, they're, they're going to look very different but um, I liked the shape of them I liked uh, the structure of them I figured, you know, why why go out of my mind machining a piece of brass and have it come out looking not nearly as nice uh, in terms of roundness and, and overall bearing surface. So, um, so in addition to those, I also have the now the tube. I also have uh, 25. I will have 25 empty brass shells minus the base plate. So. If I need them, they'll get melted down too. Or they might get cut open into sheets, but the thickness of the brass at the base is much thicker than up at the front. And I'm not really short on brass uh, because this came today. This, it's surreal. It really is. It's really weird getting something like this in the mail. Um, this is a 90 millimeter artillery shell uh, casing. This was fired, 
It is not a practice round. It is not a dummy. This was actually fired in sometime around 1953. That was the stamp. So I would guess over in Korea somewhere. Uh, the war, I would suppose, uh, more or less shut down uh, after this was spent. It didn't have time to be reloaded if they did that. I don't know. But this is about 10 to 14 pounds worth of a very nice brass uh, as it is. I, I got actually a little panicky after I ordered it that the person who sold it uh, might not know what she had or he had, and it was actually steel or aluminum. But sure enough... Uh, put a little um, put a little wire wheel to this and got a, a real nice gold uh, yellow brass uh, shine come through. So um, I'm going to be using the casing of this for the most part uh, uh, to do some of the flat uh, the flat sheet work, um, but there's more than enough of this to go around. So I am I'm not concerned about running out of brass anytime soon. So that brings me to well, melting the brass down. And uh, the way this is going to work is um, I, have a, uh, I have a melting crucible, I have uh, a torch, and it looks, it looks really cobbled together, and it is. I don't have proper hose, and you know, when you're dealing with flammable gases, you just make do. It's, not a safety issue, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, actually, they're pretty sturdy. They're just not real convenient to use. Um, and uh, I have an ingot mold. And uh, this is an open mold, which I'm not fond of, but it does a really nice job for this particular task. Uh, and this is going to create the structural pieces, the, the bars that will make up the, the, the bones, so to speak, in the new hand. It would be the uh, the metacarpals and the uh, proximal phalanges and medial phalanges and distal phalanges. Yeah, I don't think we ever need to say that again. Um, the process is real simple. Uh, I put the brass into the crucible while I'm heating it up with a torch flame. And uh, when, um, when I've got the amount of brass that I want, at the temperature that I want, which is going to be really freaking hot, I pour it into that mold. And I actually pour twice because it's a double mold on this side. And uh, that should be that. Now just in case, I have I have my old, uh, my trusty, my map torch. Um, if I don't think that it's quite hot enough, I'm gonna go ahead and, and double torch and bring this one online, um, mainly because the, uh, the map torch burns a few, uh, maybe two or three hundred degrees hotter than the propane. Um, I don't think it's going to be a problem because the propane torch I'm using is a monster. Uh, it actually uses compressed air uh, in addition to the propane. Um, so it's not as hot as like an oxygen and propane mix, but it's, it's a monster. It's built for melting and I think it'll do just fine. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna click this off and I'll restart when I'm ready to go and um, Probably going to turn the sound off or re-edit it or, or just let it go, but you won't hear me talking because I have to have an air compressor running and and I don't I don't want to I don't want to worry about that. So.
not bad. Not bad. Um, if you noticed, uh, it was a hell of a time keeping that torch going. Um, I think the map torch probably helped. I think next time I'm going to go ahead and hook the, um, hook the acetylene gas up to it uh, instead of the propane as the acetylene gas is quite a bit hotter than propane. But um, there it is, two pours. Now you notice they didn't pour all the way out to the end. That's okay. I, I'm not judgmental. They're going to get cut down to size anyway. Let's see what we got. Good, good, hard. Yeah. Ooh. Thought I might have to wait a little bit, let them cool a little bit more. But it looks like it's going to go. Essentially, the... Um, The shrinkage on the brass, the expansion is quite a bit different than that of the iron. And the iron being cold at, to begin with, it didn't expand at all, well, noticeably. And um, in just a few uh, minutes, as you see, the uh, brass shrinks enough that it can be pulled, popped right out. And it's hot. In case anybody isn't clear what they say, right? Hot brass looks just like cold brass. Well, that's what hot brass looks like. There's water. All right, cool. First one done.